Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop, co-host of Radio Rothbard. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Rothpod. This is a big week for us. This is our fall campaign. If you've visited the website, you'll see pop-up ads, you'll see it on social media. The reason why we do this is because we are a nonprofit that needs donations to continue. We don't have any big oligarch donors. We certainly get no government grants. We only rely upon people like you that understand the importance of Austrian economics, of revisionist history, of good Rothbardian political commentary, the topics that we like talking about here on Radio Rothbard. So if you have not done so yet, please consider making a $5 monthly donation that will make you a sustaining member, put you in very high standing in my view. And best of all, this week during our campaign, you'll get a free copy of Anatomy of the State, the classic by Mary Rothbard. Again, $5 a month, that's less than just about every streaming platform out there. Um, again, look up, you're probably paying for something you're not using, but you are using the Mises Institute if you're listening to this show. So you can do so by visiting Mises.org slash RR5. That's Mises.org slash RR5. You can also find the link in the show notes below. Again, I hope you'll consider being a sustaining member this week. Thank you. Now on to the show. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. With me today is my co-host, Tho Bishop, and also with us is our guest, Aaron Sobchak. Aaron is a reporter for Responsible Statecraft, which is the publication of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And he's uh, authored several articles for us in recent years at Mises.org. And what caught my attention for this episode of Radio Rothbard is a recent article he wrote called It's Always Been Hamiltonian Statecraft. And in this article, Aaron takes a look at uh, what is wrong with modeling American foreign policy on Hamiltonian ideas of foreign policy. And uh, I thought this is a great opportunity to really look at the problem with Hamilton in general. Really, Hamilton is one of the great villains of American history, opposing free markets, opposing freedom, supporting centralized and powerful states, including one for the United States. And uh, I thought uh, we should look at that in a little bit more detail. And we'll start off then with uh, looking at it in light of Hamilton's awful foreign policy as well. Uh, but before we do that, just want to make sure and mention that the clock is ticking and we're getting pretty close to our supporter summit for 2024. That will be in Hilton Head, South Carolina, beginning on October 10th. You can sign up at Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G slash events. And Ryan, the clock is also clicking for our fall campaign this week. If uh, anyone out there, if you're listening to Radio Rothbard, you're obviously a fan of revisionist history and uh, the topics that we're going to be discussing on this show. And we've got a great deal because it's a fall campaign. If you become a recurring member for just $5 a month, that's less than a Netflix account, uh, you can visit us at Mises.org slash RR5. RR is in Radio Rothbard. Mises.org slash RR5. And if you become a recurring member, you get a free copy of Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard, a noted Hamilton disrespecter as well. All right. Well, Aaron, let's talk about Alexander Hamilton. Uh, we'll just start off talking about your article, and I think that'll take us into some other pieces of it. And rather than, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to kick it over to you. You just, you just tell us um, really what what grabbed your your interest with this this Mead article and kind of just just take it from there and uh, and tell us what the problem is with Hamilton's foreign policy? Yeah, so um, when reading the the Walter Russell Mead article and some of his other works, he has this uh, kind of narrative that he consistently uses uh, a very uh, easy narrative to understand if you're not familiar with foreign policy uh, or history even. Um, the narrative is that, you know, there are four camps of um, uh, roughly, you know, four camps of international relations thought. Uh, you have the Jacksonian pop populists who are like, 
you know, we're going to leave the world alone unless you attack us or our allies. You have the Jeffersonian isolationists, he calls them, and they are, uh, you know, we're just going to practice non-interventionism because that's when the that's you know the world will like us better if we uh, don't mess with them. Um, and then he, he goes into the of course the the Hamiltonians, which he per, he gives them kind of a pragmatic mercantilism uh, mercantilistic uh, perspective, um, which he actually he actually applauds. Um, and then he, he goes into like the Wilsonian liberal tradition, which is um, the League of Nations, kind of uh, where we're here to change the world for the better uh, uh, train of thought. So he, he, he gives this outline and, you know, I'm like, okay, maybe rhetorically this makes some sense. Each of these presidents did have, you know, at least say some of, or give some of this rhetoric at one point or another. Um, but then he starts going into examples of, you know, how presidents in American history, even recent presidents, have either fallen strictly into the Jacksonian or Wilsonian camps, um, and how the, the, that uh, line of international thinking has been, uh, uh, or how, I guess how the non-Hamiltonian line of international relations thinking has been uh, prominent in American culture and history. Um, and he gives some examples there. And I just, it's really hard when you look at uh, maybe the, the actions of Wilson or Obama or Trump or really almost any president to, to come to that conclusion. Uh, so he praises Alexander Hamilton's um, uh, love of the British and their mercantilism and how even though of course it's not economically efficient uh, and then he goes on to say if only you know American presidents actually acted with a Hamiltonian foreign policy then we might be better off and of course that's the title of the article it's always been that way uh, so that's that's what got me down this rabbit trail yeah that, that's an interesting phenomenon you encounter here uh, I mean, the whole premise of the article, and the article in question here is by uh, Walter Russell Mead. It was in Foreign Affairs, which is uh, the, the bi-monthly magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, so you can't get much more establishment than this in terms of uh, foreign policy reading. And I like to read Foreign Affairs. I mean, it has useful information in it. You just can't, you just need to take their conclusions with a grain of salt always. But when I was reading Mead's article, I just, I always am reminded of how when you're a hardcore interventionist, it like, it doesn't matter uh, how, how interventionist you are, it's never enough. And you see this a lot of the time with, say, the Heritage Foundation and such, where the, if, if defense spending, that is war spending, doesn't keep up at the same pace it was increasing at in the past, then these conservatives declare that somehow American foreign policy has taken a isolationist turn. That anything that is not full bore imperialism and nonstop interventionism, suddenly everyone's an isolationist, like in some sort of uh, old school Jeffersonian sense, which isn't, I wouldn't even really describe. Jefferson as as wanting to uh, completely withdraw from uh, political connections with other states. Uh, but that's always what they say. And it just has you uh, similarly, I think the domestic policy equivalent are left wing and in, uh, market interventionists. That is people who are always in favor of higher taxes, more government regulation. They're always telling us how the American economy is unregulated. And how a, the problem, every time there's a new financial crisis, it's because uh, the government is essentially unregulated. There, there's not regulation of real estate. There's not regulation of the financial sector. Uh, there was too much deregulation going on. Now, if you know anything about those sectors, you know that that's just laughable to, to claim that those sectors are somehow unregulated or that there's anything resembling laissez-faire going on in the American economy. But that's something they constantly argue. Every time in history that there's a new financial crisis, it was laissez-faire. There was laissez-faire in the late 19th century, and then the trust busters fortunately fixed that. No more laissez-faire. But then somehow laissez-faire materialized again in the 1920s, magically. And then that caused the Great Depression. And this just goes on and on. And then there was laissez-faire again during the, the Reagan years. And then in 2007, more laissez-faire. It's amazing how this laissez-faire, how America keeps going back to laissez-faire somehow uh, without any actual reforms. Uh, but you, you encounter the same thing with foreign policy is you literally heard people on, uh, nine 12, that is the day after nine 11 claiming that the United States was just minding its own business. 
uh, had withdrawn from the world and, and since the Cold War was doing nothing in the world. And, and these, these horrible uh, terrorists only hate us because we're free. And that was the only reason anyone could come up with why they would attack the U.S. because, of course, uh, the U.S. wasn't doing anything anywhere in the world. Which is, of course, again, a laughable proposition. And that just seems to be a lot of what Meade is trying to say here. And I just find found it quite remarkable. Like, how much intervention would please Meade is unclear. But obviously, it would take a lot more than it's currently going on. Yeah, and what's... Goodness, a lot, a lot of good things there. Um, what's, what's so astounding is not even 9-12, but you go back to uh, listen to like the 2008 Republican debates, um, and it is uh, still like Giuliani, uh, Ron Paul's moment uh, when he essentially has this back and forth with Giuliani, and it is Giuliani's like, wow, I've never heard that perspective before that we... Uh, that's truly astounding that, that we that our foreign policy. And then he asked Ron Paul to respectfully retract his statement, like it was such a, a terrible thing to say. Um, and the fact that you had those kinds of people running for president that at least claim to have never heard such an idea of, of blowback before um, a basic idea in foreign uh, affairs. So, um, yeah, I think it's just um, Americans, um, for whatever reason, um, have this idea where we 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 like to stick our heads in the sand, um, but uh, you know, and then when when bad things happen, we're like, wow, I've been paying attention the whole time, and we haven't done anything wrong. How could this happen? Um, and then when it when it comes to uh, Meade's assertion here, so he asserts, you know, like you were saying, that it, you know, we need to break away from this isolationist or Jacksonian or liberal tradition. Um, but, you know, he notes in another talk that he gave that, you know, Abraham Lincoln and, and T.R., Teddy Roosevelt, proudly wore the Hamiltonian label. They proudly said, we are fans of Hamiltonians, we're, we're carrying along this Hamiltonian tradition. Um, and it, it's pretty, pretty uh, important to note that neither one of them were considered uh, isolationists on a foreign policy or economic front. Um, and, and in fact, especially T.R. may be one of the worst in, when it comes to foreign policy matters. Um, and, you know, some of the atrocities committed during like, the American-Filipino War and, and things like that. So, uh, and these are two, w w whenever a modern president is asked to list their favorite presidents, you know, these two consistently come up, you know, in a top five. So the fact that these heroes of American history, um, you know, proudly uh, label themselves Ham Hamiltonian, how it's, it blows my mind how he can in any way pretend um, that in American politics, that we've been isolationist. The only, the only string of truth that he he really presents is some of the rhetorical, maybe maybe cultural wishes. Um, like you know, Donald Trump did say he would bring the troops home. He'd be you know for America first, and and in some ways he did a whole lot better than you know like say Bush Jr. for example. But um, that's still e even that rhetoric um, and the 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 wishes, the, the political will that elected him wasn't enough to actually get us out of Iraq or Syria or get us to stop bombing Somalia. It wasn't enough to uh, completely go against, you know, his personal choices to involve us with the Saudis uh, even closer and tear up the Iran deal. So um, th this idea that we've, we'll, we just need to go back to uh, Hamiltonian pragmatic where the business is working with the government and then we'll be all good. Um, and, and he even notes in his article that uh, a lot of corruption occurs during that time when business and government are working closely, but it's okay because the, the, the country still flourishes. You know, he basically justifies that the, the corruption is okay because of that. Um, and, you know, he talks about the Marshall Plan and a couple of other things, but, um, but no matter, it seems that no matter the, the political will or the r rhetorical sense of we need to get back to liberal liberal foreign policy or isolationist foreign policy, um, no matter that, we still cannot break away, it seems, from this uh, being involved around the world in this almost empire state that we have. Um, and uh, I, I think it's time we uh, reject the Hamiltonian tradition that that's been leading us for so long rather than embrace it even more, as he's suggesting. Well, ultimately, it seems to me that you know whenever people throw around the, the word Hamiltonian statecraft. You know, we've seen this rise with national conservative circles when it comes to economic nationalism and kind of 
conservative defenses of greater economic intervention. Obviously, we have this on the, the foreign policy side. I mean, it's, it's really just a, a way of saying we need the experts back in charge, right? We need the grown-ups in the room. And, and as you mentioned, what's, what's fascinating is that you know, during the Bush years, for example, it was the neoconservatives that themselves were trying to claim explicitly the mantle of Alexander Hamilton for advocating their policies. David Frum, uh, you know, before the, the Hamiltonian play came out, right, it was David Frum that would write uh, perhaps the most frequently in Washington circles about the need for this return to a Hamiltonian foreign policy uh, after the Cold War and the like. And, and again, it's, it's interesting now because you have this, this growing rise, again, from both economic and foreign policy circles of, you know, Hamilton is kind of a filler in for, okay, okay what we have right now, right, we, 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 we want to distance ourselves from Bush era foreign policy. We don't want, but we still want to grow the state, right? In, in Meade's article, right, he, he constantly refers to both Hamilton's biography of courage, right, he, he, he fought in these wars. He was, at the end of the day, what guided Hamilton was enlightened patriotism. And his view of enlightened patriotism was the growth of the centralized state. It was the growth of the empire versus the nation. And um, of course, if we, if we actually look at Hamilton foreign, Hamiltonian foreign policy, what Hamilton actually advocated, right? It was a massive expansion of the borders. It was invasion of Canada. It was, you know, he, it, was, it was this dream, this military dream of a, of a much larger footprint by the power of the sword, even if it meant cutting down other patriots that were not o okay with his, his viewpoints there. And so really it's just a stand in for give the elites of Washington whatever they want because they are the enlightened class and everyone who has concerns about these issues, who have concerns about the trade off between military adventurism and you know, the, the, the health of the, of the people, of the nation, of, of individual liberty, that those need to be discarded for this more lofty, enlightened idea of what America could, could be if only we had the political will to follow our enlightened leaders. Yeah, yeah, and that's, um, and, and I guess looking at, it's, it's almost, it's very utopian, it's very fairy tale in nature, um, the way that these kinds of people view history uh, and view especially American history. Um, it's, it's the idea that we can do everything all over the world um, while also maintaining moral superiority from the rest of the world. And um, it, it's, it's really silly. They, for some reason, we have this idea that we can never be as bad as the British or anyone else who pursues empire or world conquest. Uh, we're somehow different. Um, and then when, and part of this fairy tale is the mercantilism. It's these, this protectionism measures that Hamilton was uh, notably fond of. You know, he rejected Adam Smith's model. He rejected all sound arguments against um, mercantilism and for uh, laissez-faire, somewhat free economies. And, um, and also in, in Mead's article, he, Mead himself embraces this, this type, this model, this uh, connection of the, this explicit connection of business interests and state interests, and you know us, us, uh, you, you know you guys and us who are somewhat knowledgeable of you know public choice theory or American history, we know that corruption exists. We know that um, business interests will always overlap or will always find a way to be entrenched in, into the government. Um, but this kind of explicit acceptance, um, I think it's uh, pretty dangerous and tantamount to some fairly uh, nefarious political ideologies. It's also just straight up wrong. I mean, we know that the free market works. Uh, we know that uh, the, the government trying to plan economies with uh, protectionism or mercantilism is uh, dangerous. And uh, it's led to some uh, times in American history where we've had a whole lot less than we could have, like at the effects of the Smoot-Hawley tariff. So it's it's pretty uh, absurd that he would look at this model and then um, embrace it. Um, and then, of course, there's the the cost of life. You know, there's uh, you know when you look at countries who have explicitly exploited other parts of the world for their own, um, or countries or kings who have done this for their own economic benefit. Um, you know, I think about King Leopold's Belgium um, and how he he exploited that colony. Um, until there's really nothing less to, left to exploit from it, and estimates of around 10 million people were killed there. Um, and you know, British, the, uh, the British had vicious wars to hold onto the colonies, so did the French. So the idea that we should uh, look fondly at these models of what's essentially neo-colonialism, of uh, exploiting the rest of the world um, and, and making sure that our business partners in the country are happy, 
Um, I think there's some some strong economic uh, arguments against this, uh, as well as some, some moral hazards uh, to take a closer look at or to, or to remember. Well, and I should remember, right, as you note, at, on a domestic policy level, Hamilton was high tax, high intervention. Uh, he, of course, wanted to introduce uh, the liquor tax, which uh, <laughs> was a big part of precipitating the... Um, the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, Hamilton was completely on the wrong side of that. And tariffs are taxes. They increase taxes on the domestic population. And he thought that was great. What's interesting is that the, the classical liberals, that as a movement, were founded on being anti-mercantilist. That this was one of the absolutely central premises of the liberals from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And Hamilton never fit into that. He always had these ongoing sympathies for the kings of the old world. And a lot of his motivation in the revolution always just seemed to be he wanted to be in charge of his own country, uh, but he didn't seem to have any particular problem with the policies of the old world. And, and that really separated him from the rest of the so-called founding fathers. And that's how you always know when you're dealing with someone who hasn't really read much about the, the revolutionary period is they just refer to the founding fathers as just kind Another of a one monolithic group, right? Right. It's just this, it's this, it's this group where everybody agreed on the same stuff. When, of course, in reality, many of them hated each other. And and one of my favorite books on this is a, a book by the historian uh, John Furling. And I, I I bring it up every few years in formats like this, just because I think it's a really good b book and an introduction to how kind of the founding fathers. Um, disliked each other in many cases, it's called Adams and Jefferson, and it's about the election of 1800. And he just goes on, there's some sections in here, just how everybody hated Hamilton. John Adams hated Hamilton. And a lot of the time, like the conservatives, they like to quote Hamilton, or they, they like to quote Adams, because um, Adams is a, he's not like Jefferson and that he's just kind of has more of a conservative feel to him. So they can't stomach Jefferson, these, these conservative types. So the, they'll go to Adams, fine. Well, Adams hated Hamilton, too, uh, as did Abigail Adams. There's a whole section here by Furling about how Abigail overheard uh, Hamilton talking about how he, Hamilton, thought that Caesar was the greatest man who ever lived, which horrified uh, Abigail Adams because Caesar, if you're claiming to be in favor of freedom, Caesar should not be your guy. And... Uh, and then later he talks about how Adams just took to calling in, in, uh, in private life. Adams would just refer to Hamilton as Caesar, as kind of like, you know, just kind of a snide remark. And, and then, of course, on top of that, we have the fact that Hamilton was in favor of the central bank. And right. he wanted all these institutions that favored the rich and powerful and screwed over regular people. And we're supposed to think that this, oh, he's a founding father. He, he's more or less like Jefferson. He's pretty much like Samuel Adams. I mean, he, he was absolutely kind of the fifth columnist among the founding fathers who wanted a return to old world type authoritarianism. And you see that in so much of his own thinking. And he carries that over into foreign policy too. Well, and that's kind of great ironies here is that Hamilton is remembered as this great Anglophile. Right, he wanted to bring us back to the great, to the great British subtle system. He wanted to import it over, and yet one of his biggest influences uh, was uh, Colbert. It was uh, Louis XIV's main, main advisor, and so he, he was a neo absolutist. Right, he, that that was that was what he saw as the the model of governance that was best out there. And of course, if you look at the foreign policy of Louis the Fourteenth, right, it's, it's hardly uh, you know one, one could argue that. Uh, restrained, uh, pragmatic approach to the world is, is perhaps not the, the greatest thing there. And of course, the irony of, of all of this is that, you know, for the conservatives defending this entire worldview, right, is that 100 years after uh, Colbert policies, right, you have the bankruptcy of the crown, you have the great crisis of France, you have the revolution, right? So if you want to, to sow, if you want to see how the, the seeds were sown, bringing about, you know, the great defining moment of right and left within you know, European politics, right? If you, if you want to see you know, what sowed the seeds for the French Revolution, you could look to the very sort of intellectual well that was the guiding light for Hamiltonian policy. And of course, this is kind of replicated in its own right within the United States circles, right? Where it takes four years after, uh, uh, after George Washington leaves office for the Washington party of, of, of President Adams to be thrown out of the office in favor of uh, you know, Jeffersonian, you know, the, the Jeffersonian party that is more aligned with the liberal ideas that sparked the revolution 
and was really what, what led more of the founding fathers, kind of you know, that, that was more in tune with what the, the people actually took up arms against the, against the, the armies of old. Yeah, and I, um, I think one of the most dangerous things about Hamilton was that he, um, while he was completely incorrect on economics and foreign policy, he was, he was uh, rather smart and he was able to get things done that he wanted to get done, whether it was through corruption or conniving, scheming. Um, and uh, he really, uh, of course, one notable example that, that um, Patrick Newman would remind us of is uh, when uh, he, he convinced, he kind of duped George Washington into supporting the, the National Bank. In return, he would give, or uh, he, he would make sure it was placed on land that was close to George Washington's land that was uh, not worth very much, and George Washington accepted with the hope that his land would uh, increase in value. Um, so he did that, and then even uh, Noah Webster uh, was uh, like a Federalist, uh, ultimately agreed with Hamilton on a lot. He, uh, he said that Hamilton's ambition, pride, and overbearing temper had destined him to be the evil genius of this country. Um, and so evil, yes, but also genius. You know, he, he really was able to push through a lot of things that um, uh, he wanted. He, he really helped the Constitutional Convention to be what it was, a uh, takeover of the Nationalist Federalists, and uh, to, to ensure that things like necessary and proper clauses and uh, general welfare clauses were included into the Constitution. Um, so I think when discussing all of this, uh, we can thank God for Aaron Burr, maybe, and. Uh, and uh, that, that a whole lot worse wasn't able to happen uh, at, you know, in the future of Hamilton because he sure was able to get a lot of things done. So, Mike, I think my final question for you then, Aaron, is what do we say to people when they get drawn into these, these fantasy ideas of Mead, which is that the United States is somehow falling into patterns of isolationism and he like he in his article he talks about how obama withdraws from humanitarian intervention uh midway through his uh his his presidency which i just see no evidence of i, I like what when when we look around the world what evidence is there of the U.S. withdrawing at all and really what how would we how should we describe really the current uh, posture of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. intervention in the world right now, because it certainly doesn't seem very isolationist to me. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And every single example he gives, he either that one particular example is uh, can be counterpointed with uh, dozens of other examples, or that example isn't exactly correct. Uh, when it comes to giving examples of presidents uh, withdrawing from the from the world uh, stage, so. I, I would say that prior to prior to World War II and the Marshall Plan, the United States had a few forays into imperialism and um, and was kind of back and forth on whether or not we were going to maintain isolationism or not. We there were some genuine periods of like maybe after World War One, we we wondered why we got involved in World War One at all. So I think there were some general, genuine periods of American skepticism towards inter, uh, intervening around the world uh, prior to World War II. But then the Marshall Plan was honestly, I think um, maybe Alexander Hamilton would be very happy with the Marshall Plan. Um, uh, just the fact that American business and American interests were able to be cemented um, all over the world at this point. We were seen as the, the victors, the, the great heroes after World War II. Um, uh, Truman especially, uh, and not, not so much Eisenhower, but Truman especially worked hard to make sure that the American uh, model and, uh, and American interests were greatly, um, uh, were greatly seen as much as important around the world. So uh, really since the Marshall Plan, there hasn't been an, uh, a, a firm time when America has decided to withdraw. You know, there's been some good instances of detente. Um, like uh, with China and, and Nixon and even Reagan uh, and, and the way he acted towards the end with uh, the Soviet Union. Um, but for the most part, it's been um, when genuine humanitarian crisis has come up that, um, that w where potentially there could be some kind of good done. We gen generally stick out, like Carter did not intervene uh, during the Rwandan genocide. Of course, Carter might be one of the, 
the the most recent examples of a uh, um, potentially uh, foreign policy uh, or liberal when it comes to foreign policy, and he did not intervene then. Um, but then you know, like Obama, who uh, spoke uh, spoke all the right words uh, for liberal foreign policy. Um, you know, yeah, he pulled out of Libya. You know, after we destroyed the country, basically. Um, and, and yeah, he didn't go all into Syria. He just got us invo involved enough to make sure that we would have a small force there forever. Uh, but uh, he, he famously um, allowed the Saudis to commit, you know, their essentially genocide against the Yemeni Houthis. And we essentially bankrolled the Saudi Air Force. And there were reports of Americans, you know, in the planes helping these Saudis learn to fly them and refuel. Um, and what's what's the humanitarian angle there? Uh, oh, that's right. We we were on the opposite side of it. Um, and then so the moving moving after Obama to Trump, you know, like I said, Trump had some decent uh, America first rhetoric, and he he started the process of giving getting us out of Afghanistan. So kudos where kudos is due. Um, but he ultimately tore up the Iran deal, which was, in my opinion, one of the only good things that come out of the Obama presidency. Um, and he really hammered, hammered home the idea that we need to um, assist Israel in every way possible, be super aggressive against Iran, um, continue bombing campaigns in Pakistan and Somalia, uh, and keep troops in Syria and, and Iraq. Um, and even when he would have occasional good ideas related to an America first foreign policy, the, his advisors, the, the, the foolish people that he chose to pick um, uh, around him, and even you know, the, the deep state, if you will, would not allow him to follow through with some of his good ideas. Um, so maybe that goes to show it, it's, it's not just about the president. It's about um, the, the administrative interests that go beyond the president that's in charge. Um, so if someone wants to say that you know, America has been falling off of the world stage, we need to do better, um, I would say that um, um, it, it is true that some other countries have begun to engage in diplomacy where America previously had. Um, I'm thinking about China and the Middle East, um, and I'm thinking also about the potential strengthening of BRICS. I don't think that is because we have uh, wanted that to happen, though. I don't think that's, that's like, hey, guys, we're going to step out and let you take over now. We're done. I think it's more of... Um, Antony Blinken, as well as some diplomats before him, have been so absolutely ineffective and terrible, um, and that this this constant blowback we're seeing is really starting to become too expensive and too costly um, and unsustainable. So any any type of removal that you're seeing that people would point to, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's voluntary. I, I think it's because we have no other choice in some instances because we're just getting so bad at mis or managing the blowback right now. Well, on the topic of the Rwandan genocide, you mean uh, Clinton, not Carter, on that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Because, of course, that was in 94. But that's, it's, it, that's an interesting case to bring up, right? Because that was early in Clinton's presidency. And Clinton was much less interventionist early in the presidency. And we see the deep state go to work on him over time, right? He comes in and the U.S. was already meddling in, in with uh, embargoes of Iraq and all of that stuff under George H.W. Bush. Clinton comes in and elects to not get involved in the Rwandan genocide. And, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that was the correct decision. There's been some good research on that. And I, and I did an article on uh, which we'll link in the in the description on humanitarian intervention. Uh, and the problem with it, because it's always just assumed that it ends as intended, that it ends with the good guys winning and, and uh, the intervening state uh, doing it right. But there's almost no examples of that actually working out. And so Clinton chose not to get involved in that. And then, boy, was he so criticized. The, all of the academics uh, the, who prefer intervention, all of the deep state actors just absolutely started turning the screws on Clinton after that. And so then... Uh, the next thing you know, it's just a, a full-on case for intervention in Yugoslavia that came right. soon after that. By 1998, Clinton's bombing people left and right, uh, and then left off as very much as an interventionist. And I think you do see evolution in other presidential um, administrations in, in a similar way as well. And I think because a lot of these people come in and they don't see immediately how interventionism improves the situation for Americans or even the, the state of the, the U.S. regime 
in many cases. But the foreign policy blob, they always want more intervention because in their minds, it always improves their own prestige. So then they get going. And I think you could talk a little bit about that with, um, with Clinton for sure. Uh, and although Reagan's an interesting case where he seemed to become a little bit more calm uh, over time. But I do think you see real changes over time with these people. And you can see, I think, the actual interest groups that are involved in this at work. Um, there's, there's a dynamism in a bad way uh, among the foreign policy interest groups that really do, I think, make a difference in these presidential administrations. And yeah, I think you can see that take shape in many cases. And, and I think that's one of the aspects of the Meade article that is worth uh, in, engaging with because he is portraying, you know, ultimately the kind of the, the core of the argument here, right, is that uh, what separates Hamiltonian foreign policy or Hamiltonian statecraft versus the current regime is that the current regime is more interested in best outcomes from a global perspective, right? Kind of the, the arguments for, you know, why it's so important for us to uh, to be involved with the, the, the Ukrainian conflict, right? Because if we, if we don't do there, then Europe's going to fall, yada, yada, yada. So, so we have to take it on the chin. We have to spend the money in order to keep everything good over there because then our global, you know, then, then our global prestige will decline or something kind of vague there. Whereas the, the, the economic nationalists, the, the modern day Hamiltonians are trying to say, oh, well, you know, we are interested in American national interest kind of more narrowly defined. But the, the issue there is that their notion of national interest really is Washington interest and its control over the economy, its control over the people. And you can't disconnect, ultimately, foreign policy from domestic policy because it's all the interventions that they desire within the economy that help fuel this, this broader state for these ends. And so I, I think that's one of the things that, um, that, you know, that this is why it's important to understand the um, American political traditions outside of the ones celebrated by the mainstream, the, the, the Lincolnites and, and you know, the Hamiltonians and you know, the, it all, all goes back to Washington and that tradition, right? It's important to understand the, the perspectives of you know, not just Thomas Jefferson, but, but Albert Gallatin, of kind of the, the Jacksonians um, around Andrew Jackson and the like, because you know, they, were, they were, had that same interest in terms of the well-being of the of 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 the the nation as a whole, not just simply the centralized government itself. Though obviously with Jackson, you get you know, some some unionist <laughs> tendencies there, but the the Jacksonians around him, the thought around him, um, you know, there's there's a lot a lot of differing views there. And so again, recognizing that you if if you cannot have a disconnect between this interventionist foreign policy with the interventionist domestic policy, that is ultimately the goal of these you know very serious Hamiltonians. Um, trying to right the ship from these these uh, you know anti-American globalists here that ultimately they're serving the same masters, and I think though that's kind of the danger of uh, the w the the Washington establishment. What they do is they take let's say the Ukraine situation and they put it in the frame that you just gave. If we don't stop this Russia from his um, what do they call it unprovoked aggression, Putin's unprovoked aggression. If we don't stop that then all of Europe will collapse because of this $1 trillion economy that's going to take over the whole EU. Um, and um, that's, that's the message they give. But I guess the argument from, um, from my perspective, and you guys might agree, is that uh, what the, the, the actual motivation there is, is always defense industries um, uh, gaining wealth. It's always politicians and administrators gaining wealth. Um, you know, we know that NATO, or at least we believe that um, that Ukraine is being used as a, a proxy conflict right now, uh, so that these these people can can generate wealth for themselves. Um, so we we know that there's no real worry that that Putin will invade Poland, or for example, that's not going to happen. So I think these fears that are given are just ways for. Um, the, the, the Hamiltonian enrichment um, uh, policy to be kind of painted in a, in a better light. You know, we, we need to save the world. We need to protect democracy around the world, protect freedom. Um, but when you dig a little deeper, it's always Hamiltonian foreign policy. Um, and I, I think another great example, if anyone wants to look more into that, would be like uh, what the Clintons did with Haiti um, and the, the huge crisis going on right there. And, and uh, the fact that it's, it seems unsolvable, and I think that, that was uh, purposely made that way uh, so that certain people in Washington can be enriched. 
All right. Well, I think that's a good place to, to end this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you, Aaron Sobchak, for being our guest today. And I certainly recommend his article on Hamiltonian foreign policy. We'll link to that in the description. And, of course, you can always get more uh, of that at Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. We'll be back next time with more from Radio Rothbard. So we'll see you then.